Hospital. So our speaker this morning is Jill Emery, and uh, her billing is as was put out with the thing calling the meeting. And uh, I'm going to mute everybody apart from Jill. So uh, we look forward, Jill, very much uh, to your talk. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you to uh, John. Uh, for that introduction and to uh, Douglas for making that first approach. That was uh, nice to be invited to speak to you this morning. Um, and I hope that this works okay in the format. I've done a few um, sort of talks and um, I quite often like to judge the room. So I'm, I'm judging, not, not saying anything about any of you, um, but I don't think any of you are fragile um, flowers that will be offended by any slightly racy language that I might use. I don't think you can oh. tell. Oh, Nick looks terrified at the prospect. Um, but anyway, I'm pretty familiar with ProBus and with the precursor organisations, Roundtable and Rotary. Come from a family that's got strong links. My dad was an active member of Roundtable and Rotary and my mum did all the other circular things, Lady Circle and her wheel. I spoke at my uncle's Probus Club in Falkirk and then another close family friend spoke to his club um, at South Queensbury and I think it might be my uncle Alec I have to thank for this recommendation so I hope uh, I don't let him down. Um, so yeah, as the title suggests, going to just chat a bit about some of my uh, experiences, um, many and varied since joining the police, Lothian and Borders Police back in 1986. Um, so at that time, it was still quite an unusual thing for a career choice for a woman. Uh, and I think for someone like me who'd been uh, to Dollar Academy, uh, being a study of English at Edinburgh University, uh, well, I was something of a, a unicorn uh, joining the police at that time, and certainly my parents weren't alone in being horrified. Um, but anyway, yes, I interview uh, the chair of the selection panel, who was uh, quite a scary man. I actually enjoyed the nickname Jumping Jimmy because of his uh, irate outbursts. Uh, but he kind of looked me up and down um, and he, he commented that I wasn't, I was very, um, very complimented to hear that I, he thought I wasn't bad looking uh, and he thought that possibly I could get a man without joining the police, which was, uh, which was good to know. Um, but yeah, if I, if I uh, didn't join uh, to secure a husband, uh, which I did by the way, but anyway, um, if it wasn't the primary reason for joining the police, then um, why did I? Uh, and, I? And I can only say that it was um, because I wanted to do something that I thought would be worthwhile, that I wanted to make a difference, all these sorts of cliches, um, but they hold true and they hold true today. So uh, I've never regretted it, I had a great um, career. Um, but I did join Lothian and Borders, as I say, because I was studying in Edinburgh, so I'd been away from home uh, as a 17-year-old. But typical of the time, being an unmarried uh, young woman, um, Lothian and Borders posted me to the furthest most, the point of the uh, force area that was closest to my parents, because clearly I would need to uh, be there. Um, and that was Bathgate, a place I had never been before. Um, but I was part of the division that includes your good selves in Linlithgow. Uh, and, and it was a great, absolutely great division to work with and loads of great people. Uh, but I have to say it did come as something of a culture shock, uh, more uh, the organisation than the place. Um, but yeah, I turned up on my first day and I had the, if you remember Juliet Bravo on the telly, I had the little... Uh, the little hat and the tunic and the straight skirt, which was rubbish for running in, let me tell you. Um, but yeah, we didn't have any of the personal protective equipment you see the cops with now. They've got these big belts now with everything, including an inflatable dinghy on it. You know, they've got their stab proof vests. We just had a tunic with silver buttons. And as a woman, I had a wooden baton, which was about this big, so it could fit in the handbag. The, the men got the bigger batons that had a special pocket. So you can fill in the blanks about all the jokes about my little 
Barton. But anyway, yeah, it was a, it was a, a different time. Um, yeah, so the first question my inspector asked me was, what foot do you kick with? Which I was completely baffled by and I kind of uh, sort of floundered and said, well, I don't know, sir, because I played hockey at school. Wrong answer. So yeah, that was a that was a slightly um, difficult start. Um, I got I was part of a detail being taken on a, a, a bus into Edinburgh to police a football match. I won't say which one. Um, but yeah, I'd never been to a football match with my a, a background. I'd only been to rugby, of course, where the odd enthusiastic supporter would shout, run like a stag, Quentin, you know. Um, so I was ill prepared for the whole stand to start shouting and chanting, get your tits out for the boys. Um, so just that's the first warning alert in case anyone's offended. I'm just checking if anyone's fallen off their chair. No, good. But yes, it was it was a pretty uh, uh, difficult start. Um, yeah, I was paired with a much more experienced older male officer who I thought was about a hundred, but was probably you know forty. Um, but he did seem to have quite a bit of a problem telling the difference between the gear stick and the panda car and my knee. But that was fine, took it all in good part because, you know, desperate to fit in and all of that. Uh, but one day I thought, you know, I'm going to have to say something. Um, you know, we got a warrant for someone's arrest. We went to the door. He bent down and started shouting through the letterbox. And I was just like mortified. Um, and I said, you know, what are you doing? And he said, I'm trying to get Chummy Boy to come to the door. I said, well, what makes you think that shouting arsehole through the letterbox is going to help? And he said, I'm not shouting arsehole, I'm shouting parcel. So, yeah, something was a bit lost in translation at times. But somehow I did survive. Uh, and I worked my way through the ranks over the years and I made the most of all the opportunities that I had. Uh, I served uh, in detective roles uh, a lot of the time during my service. Um, but yeah, we had quite a few pivotal moments over the years. So I was in a, a specialist unit quite early on uh, investigating rape and child sexual abuse and that was uh, probably the making of me and my career and I've always kind of come back to that sort of public protection role um, and I knew that was that is really um, where it dawned on me that the difference that you can make to someone's life depending on how you react this could be the first time someone's spoken about something really traumatic and the way that I dealt with that person would affect, you know, without overplaying my part, but it could affect how somebody comes to terms with that um, for the rest of their lives. And I've still got people that keep in touch with me um, after all these years that I've dealt with uh, back at that difficult time. So uh, that was a really um, formative experience in the police. Um, I think I'd been in about 10 years um, and um, after I had had my sons by then um, and I was posted to a, a murder review in Aberdeen, which wasn't particularly easy living in Bathgate, having two small children. Um, but at the time, there was no question of my uh, turning that down or saying, you know, excuse me, you know, that's quite difficult. I do remember having to say to one of my bosses at one time that one of my sons had broken his leg at school. Uh, he was at Bathgate Academy and he broken his leg and, and he, and he kind of said, well, he's got another one, you know, was what's the problem so yes i kind of got on with it and and went uh, up to to aberdeen to do that that murder review and uh, yeah it was another pretty difficult uh, case the little boy was not much older than my eldest um and there had been a real botch up with the way that the investigation had been uh, carried out and there had been some assumptions uh, made uh, really based on class uh, to be honest, uh, rather than actually uh, following the evidence that proved ultimately uh, the predatory sex offender had murdered this wee boy. 
Um, so it wasn't a surprise uh, after that that I kind of uh, moved on to professional standards and investigating complaints against the police. Um, and I am really passionate about the high standard of service to the public. Um, and it's just a tiny minority of officers who do let the service at themselves and the public down. Um, so both public protection and professional standards complaints have been recurring themes through my over 30 years. Um, I, did a, I was in charge of Edinburgh for a few years. Uh, it was a great, that was an absolutely great job. At the time, it was one of the biggest, well, it was the biggest division in Scotland at the time, 1,600 police officers and staff. And now Glasgow, Greater Glasgow Division is uh, 2,650 staff, officers and staff, so it's huge. Um, but yeah, uh, at the time, that was, that was a big gig. And obviously, the location that it is, um, loads of incidents, loads of VIP visits, uh, things to do with the parliament, the castle, the rugby, Murrayfield, football, uh, hips and hearts. And it was absolutely great. Um, loved that job. Um, and then I was head of CID. Excuse me a minute. I think I've got to sneeze. No, passed. Right. Okay. So I did... Um, I was head of CID at Lothian and Borders before we became uh, Police Scotland. So I was uh, Rebus's boss. Um, and yeah, I do, I do recognise the character. Um, but yeah, I mean, Ian Rankin, most of you will have read uh, and certainly heard of. And he does capture Edinburgh really well because it is quite a contrast between this sort of very public facing elegant facade and underneath some real issues um, with um, substance, drug abuse um, and uh, violence and crime that, that, you know, is not so well seen, but it is a city of real inequality. You know, you only need to travel sort of a, a five or ten minutes in a car either direction to, to experience a quite different environment, uh, particularly for children uh, growing up. Um, yeah, so that taught me a lot about, you know, the communities that really want to see the police and that are on the phone to me about someone putting their bin out on the wrong day. Uh, they're the communities that really don't need to see the police and the communities that would not be on the phone and would not be in touch and probably would be quite happy if the police didn't go there are really where the police should be. Um, so yes, um, that was uh, an interesting time. Uh, but when we became Police Scotland, that was in uh, 2013. So on the Friday, I left my lovely office in Fetis, where I had a view of Fetis College over to my left. And if I stood on one leg, I could see Edinburgh Castle up to my right. I moved on the Monday to um, Pitt Street in uh, Glasgow, which is, uh, is its address, but was aptly named. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was another sort of culture shock. Um, so I became one of four detective chief superintendents who then had a remit for the whole country for crime across Scotland. So that was quite a quite marked change. Um, but actually immediately had benefits from an investigation point of view. Um, overnight, you could uh, pool resources from all over the country. Um, you know, only a few weeks earlier, I had a murder in Edinburgh. Um, I would never have dreamt of picking the phone up to Fife uh, or to Central to assist because it's our, it's our job and we would just get on with it. Whereas uh, like I say, overnight it was possible and did happen. Uh, and now it's just automatic that there's a, a murder or a major incident anywhere in Scotland and there's a whole machine that can be uh, geared up to, to meet that demand. Uh, so later on I moved back to, um, well, what's now J Division. So it was the rest of Lothian and Borders, not the city, but what were F, E, G division, so back to my roots, West Lothian, Mid Lothian, East Lothian, Scottish borders, um, and uh, had that, that was about, well, just shy of a thousand officers uh, in that role, 
um, that, that I had. And as part of that role, I became, I did the training and became a strategic firearms commander uh, and a public order gold commander. Uh, so I used to say to my sons, I was like M, you know, in the Bond uh, movies uh, where Judy Dench says, take the shot. Um, but the reality is uh, the SFC, the Strategic Firearms Command, never uh, would instruct a firearms officer uh, to, to pull the trigger. Uh, it absolutely is uh, the individual holding the gun that, that makes that choice. I would just say the criteria are met to go red and then uh, they can decide. And that's the same in a lot of policing as the most important decisions are actually taken at the lowest level. And when I say lowest, I mean uh, operational frontline officers are using their discretion, shift in and shift out, regardless of what the management uh, say. So that's where the important stuff gets decided. And then I got the opportunity to be seconded to Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary. And I went there in 2016 as the deputy on secondment. And it was just brilliant experience to be able to put back in some of that knowledge and experience that I had gleaned over the years to actually uh, decide and inspect policing um, and hopefully improve the service for the public because as I've, uh, as I've mentioned that's really what, what drives me and what I'm all about. And then the top job as in the Chief Inspector of Constabulary uh, that came up in 2018 um, and I never dreamt that I would be uh, able to apply for that, far less secure that position, uh, but I did in April 2018. And um, that it, this job is, is a royal warrant. I have a physical warrant from Her Majesty with the signature on it, uh, and it means I'm independent from government, independent from the police, the police authority, the parliament, uh, and I can under statute, under the Police and Fire Reform Act, inspect anything that I want in Police Scotland and the Police Authority, which is um, a fantastic uh, level of um, power, really, but uh, a big responsibility to use it wisely. Um, so over the years, I have tried, you know, on secondment and now in my current role, I've really tried to focus on those areas that I've mentioned that are really important about um, public protection and the things that affect people's lives most uh, and the standard of service um, that the public actually receive um, from the police. So um, I did an inspection into the forensic medical services available for victims of rape and child sexual abuse. That is really sort of going full circle. Um, and that, that inspection that I did myself in 2017 um, is now, there was a task force established, a, a ministerial task force, and now uh, there's a, a Forensic Medical Services um, Victims of Sexual Offences Act making its way through Parliament. Um, and I'm really proud of that, that this week actually, it's, it's past stage one of going through Parliament. That will change the law because of something um, that I was um, able to do in this post. Um, so similarly, uh, more recently, um, looking at the police response to online child sexual abuse, published a report on that in February this year. Um, and then in more recent times, obviously with COVID, uh, looking at the police use of the powers that they've been given. Uh, these are, I know the word is used so much now, unprecedented, but these are extraordinary powers to limit the freedoms of fellow citizens that the police wouldn't seek and wouldn't want in normal times because thankfully in the UK we have a culture uh, of policing by consent and that relationship is really precious between the public and the police. The police are citizens and police with communities, not at them or to them. Uh, so these powers place a strain on that sort of um, collegiate um, responsibility for making society as, as um, you know, positive as, as it can be. Um, 
And yes, so I've got a role at the moment in inspecting how Police Scotland use those powers. Um, so it is, it's a real privilege, this job. And I've been uh, absolutely delighted to have chosen all those years ago to join the police. And it's something that I'm still passionate about and I still hope to make a difference, a positive difference too. Um, I'm quite happy just to, to end it there and to take any questions that anyone might have if you've got time. Thank you again for asking me. Well, Joe, <coughs> absolutely fantastic. Fa fa thank you very much indeed. Yeah, so, yeah, Joe, on you go. Unmute yourself and, and carry on. Yeah, Jill, when they did away with um, the regional police forces and encompassed it as Police Scotland, what was your personal feelings about that? Was that a good thing or a bad thing? I think we all struggled to... It was it happened so fast because it was only really in 2012 that it was decided and then it was, it was you know, it was April. It was the 1st of April. You know, no coincidence. First of April, twenty thirteen, <laughs> and you know it was it was hard to grasp what it was going to be like. Um, I did think that there was real um, inefficiencies in the previous uh, system, in the sense of the different sizes of the forces. You know, when you had a chief constable of Dumfries and Galloway, which is you know for maybe five hundred officers. You know, and there was I in a division, leading a division of 1,500 officers, a division within a, a force, if you like. And yet the chief constables of each of the eight legacy forces had an equal voice at the Association of Chief Police Officers, you know, that the sort of leadership forum that made decisions for the country. So you can see that there would be some inherent kind of difficulties with that, which you could see as a... An amalgamation of the forces would, you know, would would um, improve it. So yeah, I think I think I was cautious. I certainly wasn't one of those who was. There were people who were very, very much again it very uh, felt that it would undermine that relationship, local relationships with the public. Um, but because the Police Scotland put the thirteen divisions in well, 14 initially, but put the divisional structure in pretty much mirroring the legacy police forces. So Lothian and Borders became E and J divisions. They still are. So there was still the local officers who were in Lothian and Borders were pretty much largely there, still there when the music stopped, you know, and uh, we became police Scotland. Do you think that it had a... Do you think that ultimately had an effect on the closure of local stations like Lithgow and all the various places that lost all the local police stations? Or do you think that would have happened anyway? I mean, I think the pressure on the budgets was going to be was going to be a feature anyway. And I suppose um, there would be an argument um, that that you know actually the closures would have been potentially worse if things had been in the old uh, 8-4 structure because people would have had fewer options about where savings could be made, whereas obviously being a police service for the whole of the country, there are places that, um, that, that can be closed with... I, I mean, I, I'm in two minds because, I mean, I, I've spent various times at Lynlithgow um, Police Station and at the court in Lynlithgow, uh, not as an accused. Um, but it's, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, and so there's some, it is something about the fabric of your local community that is lost when these things close. Um, and I saw that repeated in, you know, different bits, like I talked about having been in, in the Lothian and Borders division, you know, down in East Lothian and Haddington or down in the Borders and Hoyk. I mean, it's a big deal if part of your civic life is, is removed like that. So um, there are pragmatic decisions need to be taken about stations where there's actually hardly any footfall but yeah I do think it needs to be in consultation with the public. Thank you. <clears throat>
Uh, as uh, uh, we're, I'm in Winchborough, and we're growing uh, rapidly. And uh, we're going from 2,000 to 10, 12,000 maybe. Obviously, uh, the present structure, which has shrunk, it took away actually Winchborough's police station long before Police Scotland or anything like that. Um, there is a concern within the public here that, that there's never going to be any reversal of, if you like, the, the shedding of community policemen. I mean, we used to get a regular service from the community policemen. We never see them now because they're just too busy. Uh, do, is there any chance that the many promises about increasing police numbers, et cetera, et cetera, is ever likely to come to fruition. And I'm not trying to trap you on a political thing here, just interested in whether we, we're ever likely to see numbers go up. No, <laughs> I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say so. And I mean, I, um, I think it's more about, um, I mean, this whole rhetoric from the UK government about 20,000 officers, that, that is a, a replacing of officers who, that, that were cut, numbers that were cut. Um, Scotland's been on a different path because, you know, the SNP obviously had it as part of their election manifesto that they would have a thousand extra officers uh, than when they first took uh, power. And that is still the case. Um, politically, there is a, a real... Um, nervousness about reducing numbers um but and 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 there had been consideration of reducing i mean personally i don't think a number is a particularly helpful measure to say if the service is good or it isn't you know what you want to have are the right mixture of police officers and police staff civilian staff with specialist skills who can best meet the needs of the public um i mean i can't see an increase in numbers. I could see um, there being a much more sophisticated um, assessment of where officers should be, because actually I used the phrase before about, you know, um, musical chairs, you know, when the music stops in 2013, the number that were police officers at that time were, that's the number. And, and largely locally that's for me to say. Um, but actually, there's not a lot of science behind that. And I do think Police Scotland's uh, really at the point now, you know, an eighth year needs to really be more uh, transparent about, well, where, where are the demands? Like you say, areas that have grown in size, um, look at areas with, you know, nighttime economy or shopping centres, whatever is going to generate demand um, and be more sophisticated in deployment. So you might not see the overall number increase, but you should be able to see numbers increase where there's actually a need. So, yeah. are, we, are we therefore, I, I mean, one would assume listening to various people complaining about policemen being uh, blocked up doing administrative work or waiting to give evidence in courts, et cetera, et cetera, that there ought to be a margin for um, reducing that requirement. Is there any prospect of that? Yes. Yeah, I think that is well um, recognised by by the service. And, and in fairness, they are, yeah, they are trying um, to identify those sort of... Um, Opportunities to make better use of police officer time. So they have done things like um, fairly recently rolled out the, the mobile devices, you know, that police officers can access, you know, can input information and access uh, systems while they're out and about either on foot or in the car. Uh, so they don't have to keep going back to the station and that frees up a lot of time. Uh, they are working and we're doing a bit of inspection over at the moment actually uh, on uh, potential plans partly because of COVID but actually changes that people would have argued were more efficient anyway for police officers to give their evidence remotely so they could do it like well not exactly like this but you know so they're not 
physically attending and hanging about in a court all day only to be told, you know, at two or three in the afternoon, oh, you're not needed. Yeah, thank you. Okay. John, um, if we could just follow on with what you've been saying to Nick regarding staffing of policing. Every time I go on holiday, not this year, go to Italy, go to France, I see so many police around. And I spoke to a policeman once and he gave me the reason why they have to have so many police. Others are better trained. I said, well, that's okay, but we still need numbers on the streets. So could you compare our style of policing with the European policing and why do they need so many police? Or is it just a political will to put, put various layers of policing on the street? Yeah, I think in many other jurisdictions, there's a much more quasi-military uh, yes, yes, yes. relationship. And so when I talk towards the end about that precious relationship with the public, I think that is something to hold very dear in the UK um, and in Scotland that, that, you know, if you hear any of the public messaging from senior officers in Police Scotland, from the Chief Constable Ian Livingston and that senior leadership team, they talk about the old Pelian principles, you know, they talk about the public or the police, the police or the public. There's that sort of uh, contract that citizens agree to be policed. You know, this whole COVID thing, um, largely people identify the shared public good. So for the greater good, people are prepared to make sacrifices for the benefit of others. And that's a really precious thing and, and, and like I say we, we really value that in, in Scotland and, and in the UK but in, in other jurisdictions in Europe there's and in the States I mean this is why there's no equivalent between the awful uh, disgraceful events of George Floyd's murder um, and events in Scotland because they have a federal and a state system. So their, their state police can be really quite small or like thousand, multiple very small organizations in America. They're all armed and some of them are not very well trained. Uh, that is the fact. Uh, the federal layer is obviously, uh, as it suggests, is, is nationwide. Um, and in, in Scotland, uh, well, in Europe, you also have that where you get local um, yes. armed, still armed, but local police and then, you know, the national or the regional layers of policing. Yes. Um, so you might see more police officers when you're uh, travelling elsewhere, um, but I, I, I don't feel that there's the same sense of um, the motivation of police officers in Scotland is, is to, I mean, that is the, the, the line, keep people safe. I mean, obviously that's not always possible, but there is a, 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 a I hope, a feeling that the police are there to help um, in a way that isn't recognised in other parts um, of of the world, unfortunately. Yeah. And that actually features in when we're talking about um, diversity within the police and, you know, trying to attract and recruit people from a different, as many different communities that comprise society. It's very difficult to make the police an attractive career uh, prospect for people from some communities where their, their home or previous experiences, police are corrupt and not, you know, not held in high regard. It's not regarded as a, you know, a, a respectable profession to join. Um, you know, so even uh, colleagues that have joined who are uh, Polish, Eastern European, they're coming with a very different experience of policing mm -hmm. from, from where they've their families from. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Ready. Go. Lord Julian, uh, I'd like to call you G. It sounds better. <laughs> anyway, Julian, if someone breaks into my house and there's a struggle, I end up hitting them with the rolling pin and I kill them, am I guilty or not guilty? <laughs> well, I'd like to see your rolling pin. 
I mean, that's <laughs> um, yeah, well, uh, of course, it's not for the police to say who's guilty or not guilty. You would certainly be charged, yeah, and then it would be for the courts to decide. I'm sure you, you look really law-abiding. I'm sure you'd get one. Are you inv did you get involved with drugs? You know, you would obviously hear about the drug scene. Yeah. In, in so is it worse now than what it was, say, a number of years ago? Oh, it must be. Yeah. I think I've, mm, it's really difficult to tell. Um, I mean, it changes all the time. I've certainly... One of the things I didn't mention, yeah, I was about three years at the Scottish Crime and Drug Enforcement Agency in Paisley. Um, yeah, and that would be in like 2002, 2003. Um, yeah, and I think, I think, I think certainly well, there's a, there's a crisis at the moment because you'd see the publicity about um, drug deaths, people who've sadly died as a result of um, drug misuse have, has rocketed since that time. Uh, and last year it was the highest that it's, it's been uh, and, and on track to be the same. Um, and, and I think people would point to a number of factors that <coughs> actually um, you know, ironically, uh, drug users, uh, medical interventions have improved over those years. So their people are living longer uh, with substance misuse issues than before. Um, so there is absolutely a cohort of people that will be, um, you know, uh, coming to the end of their lives later uh, than, than previously when they might have succumbed to an overdose. Um, as, as prevalence, well, mm, uh, it's changed over the piece. I think that the, like the, the sort of heroin kind of um, train spotting era in Edinburgh uh, that, that I just joined round about that time, I mean, that's changed. So the drug misuse or, or the, the issues with drugs have probably um, yeah, just changed. So there's more different kinds of um, drug misuse now. Um, not so much the chaotic kind of stereotype of the injecting user uh, and more cocaine, um, ecstasy um, and, and mixtures, uh, polydrug use. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, the, the criminality has... Um, you know, it's not so much about the substance or the commodity, but the serious organised crime has absolutely increased and that commodity can be people, people trafficking um, or drugs or, you know, firearms. You see the gangland stuff in, in, the, in the West in particular. Uh, yeah, it's still a, still a real danger in communities. Thank you. Hey, on you go and meet yourself, and uh, you can have a chat. You go. Hi there, that was fascinating stuff. Ever since I was a kid, and now I have had nothing short of the utmost respect for the police. And I think everybody of Mackinac age is like that. I don't think young folk are like that anymore. What on earth has changed? I'm not sure that's the case. I'm really not. I mean, my sons are in their 20s, um, you know, lots of, well, lots of their friends have joined the police, but you know, they're, I don't know, and, and I haven't, I haven't, um, we just recruited, I'm saying we, I mean, Scotland has just recruited one of the biggest um, cohorts of police in just just passed out from the college a, a few weeks ago. Um, because they're inundated with people who want young people who want to join the police. Um, you know, there's loads of work goes on in schools and uh, yeah, I think I, I I don't really I know it's a sort of I think it's an urban myth this 
this idea is, that young people don't respect the police and don't... Is it the way the media portray things? Is I do, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. There, there's police youth volunteers is something that was being introduced uh, by Police Scotland just a few years ago. And again, they're pretty inundated with young people who want to volunteer and they get the chance to attend, obviously not at the moment, but normally various events and, and take part. And young people use it as part of their personal statement if they're going to uni, and they, they want to be able to demonstrate that they've done something um, meaningful and worthwhile to give back to their, their community. So yeah, I don't I don't really accept the, the premise of the question. <coughs> David, on you go. Unmute, David. Uh, <clears throat> morning, Jill. Uh, Hi. Yeah, I would like to congratulate you on your achievement, being a, being a woman and joining a difficult force. And of course, your career prospect and the development to a higher position. So my question is uh, to do with uh, equality. Since you have been in a higher position, what role do you think you have performed to encourage black and ethnic minority to join the, the service? Yeah, I think um, I've certainly had the opportunity in the past to try and make a difference in that direction. Um, you know, I had say, another role in the past with um, leading the safer communities um, area with, with Lothian and Borders. And I, at, at that time had um, formed a bit of a, a network with uh, women from minority ethnic communities uh, recognising that women and mothers had the opportunity to influence the career choices of young people. Uh, and at the time, and I have to say still now, there were very predictable, um, quite often self-appointed community representatives that the police liaised with and you never heard the voice of young people or the voice of mothers. Um, so uh, I did get the chance to set that network up and it still it still meets now. Um, but yeah, since that time, I mean, this current role, I think I have an opportunity to um, put the shine the light on what Police Scotland currently does to encourage as representative a police service as possible. Um, and we're just about to publish a report uh, on a sort of leadership training, basically. And one of the things that I'm saying in the introduction to that report is that the issue of diversity and equality um, deserves a separate piece of a uh, concentrated inspection so I'm giving them notice now yeah. I'm coming back and I'm going to look at that uh, because I want to know not just about recruitment but about retention about development and, and progression of people from um, different you know not just um, you know black Asian minority ethnic groups but I mentioned Eastern European uh, but also um, you know, other protected characteristics. I mean, the woman gender now is much more represented now in, in policing than it was when I joined. Uh, that's taken a heck of a long time. Yeah. Uh, so I would uh, not want to see that replicated with the other strands of diversity. So I guess I would be trying to use my role now to, again, um, contribute the knowledge that I've gleaned over the years and to put uh, to put the pressure on really to make sure that um, Police Scotland does everything that it can possibly do to attract and retain 
uh, as diverse a workforce as possible. Um, but policing is not, can't solve all these things, obviously, yeah. itself. They're reflecting the structural issues in wider society, I'm afraid, which is going to take all of us to, um, to understand that and try and change that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. It's a difficult area, you know, as you know, uh, to implement because if you see the blood in the community, maybe it brings some uh, uh, encouragement to, to people to see that right. It's not only the white police are on the street, <laughs> they make mixture, so to give confidence in few ethnic minorities to see people around. And also if there is any crime, they seem to understand the background uh, of the people. So I know it is not easy, but uh, thank you for, for what that what I wanted to, to ask you. Thank you. You're welcome. You're right. It's <coughs> really important. Absolutely. And I'll be looking specifically at processes that recognize that having the same process for everyone is does not make it fair because that's been the situation today is that you know this is the standard and that's right the standard it should be the same but the way you achieve that might be different um yeah so we could talk a whole other we could talk a whole other hour on that but uh, i agree with you it's hugely important right thank you <clears throat> You go. Any more Alan. questions? Alan? Yep. Okay. Jill, the, uh, given your own background uh, from an educational point of view and the, the literary background, um, do you currently read crime fiction? Uh, and if, if you do, who do you recommend? And we'll take Ian Rankin as a given. <laughs> yeah. Um... I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, a, I, I do enjoy, I do enjoy um, crime novel. I don't feel it's like a, a, you know, busman's holiday or something like that. I mean, I do enjoy, the most recent um, books that I read were Hilary Mantel's uh, books, um, Wolf Hall, Bringing Up the Bodies uh, and The Mirror and the Light. Um, because so there was a lot of intrigue in those because it's obviously Henry VIII's time and Cromwell and all the sort of manoeuvrings and diplomacy and diff so I enjoy those sorts of you know more um, yeah this this sort of intrigue and the politics um, yeah I'm probably not as a, as interested in in the the kind of just the crime, sort of the formulaic kind of crime thriller. Um, I like, there's a whole series called Shard Lake series written by, um, I'm going to forget the initials, but it's Sansom is the surname. And that's, again, it's kind of Tudor times, but it's a, it's a, a lawyer of those times who's a sort of quasi-investigator. And, and that's, it is still got the kind of crime thriller aspect, but it's in that kind of a uh, context and, and they're beautifully written books. So I would recommend them. Thank you. Folks, uh, I think we could probably continue this discussion until next, uh, next the next meeting, but uh, I think we should thank Jill very much for uh, yes, absolutely. everything she's done this, this morning and for stimulating a lot of thoughts in, as well. So thank you very much, Jill. Indeed, it's been really good. Uh, the recording, as always, will be put on the YouTube channel. And our next meeting is in a fortnight's time. It's about uh, St Kilda, the history of St Kilda. Yes. Uh, and somebody called Christine McPherson is going to be talking to us about that. So we look forward to seeing you all in a fortnight's time. And the recording should be, I'll try and get it up by tomorrow. So it should be available on the Probus YouTube channel tomorrow. And thanks again, Joel. I don't have anybody else. What is it? Tony, do you want to say anything else? No, well, just to say, very interesting. We've had lots of speakers uh, in different top, different subjects, specialised subjects. But you've covered one which interests everybody. <laughs> As you just said, uh, we could go on all day about the, talking about the police. 
and all of us went. And it's been a great time and enjoyed it thoroughly. Oh. Great. And, uh, and uh, oh no, fantastic. So will you all show your appreciation? Yeah. Uh, gentlemen and ladies. <laughs> even, even the muted ones are clapping. <laughs> Good to see you, Nick. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.